Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome uh, to our virtual uh, journal club. This is Mark Erkin, and I want to wish everyone a uh, happy and healthy uh, new year. Um, hoping for a better 2021 as we move forward here. I'm really thrilled um, uh, to have the opportunity uh, to revisit um, the world of pediatric thyroid cancer um, and uh, to have um, Dr. Andy Brower come back um, and uh, be a part of this program who had presented earlier. But the presentations this morning um, re are coming to you live from, um, from the Netherlands. And we have the privilege of having Dr. Hanukkah van Santen, um, who is an associate professor and pediatric endocrinologist in the Wilhelmina Children's Hospital and the Princess Maxima Center in Utrecht, Netherlands. Um, she is a chair of the Dutch and European Guidelines for Thyroid Cancer in Children, and she co-chairs the Late Effects of Childhood Cancer International Guideline Harmonization Groups for both hypothalamic uh, pituitary disorders as well as thyroid disorders. Hanukkah's um, research and care program focuses on pediatric thyroid cancers as well as craniopharyngiomas and um, endocrine effects of childhood cancer treatment. She does have a special interest in hypothalamic, pituitary, and uh, thyroid gland disorders. Um, her aim is to preserve or restore endocrine function in children with uh, cancer enabling normal growth and the development um, during and after childhood cancer treatment. And we also have the privilege this morning of um, having uh, one of her colleagues, Dr. Chantal uh, Lebink, who is um, combined MD, PhD, and specializes in pediatric uh, differentiated thyroid cancer at the same institutions in Utrecht. Um, her research focuses on thyroid dysfunction during childhood oncology treatment and on pediatric thyroid cancer. She is the coordinator of Dutch and European um, guidelines for treatment of pediatric thyroid nodules and thyroid carcinoma. And then our discussant this morning, who will take a look at um, the uh, guidelines that are being presented, um, which were recently published um, in 2020, is Dr. Andrew Bauer, who is Professor of Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine, University of Pennsylvania, and is the Director of the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's Thyroid Center. Um, Dr. Bauer retired from the U.S. Army after 33 years of service to include, uh, that included two combat tours in Iraq. Um, Dr. Bauer's clinical and research interests open a, um, a span across the spectrum of pediatric thyroid disorders, and he has published extensively um, in uh, peer-reviewed journals, chapters, and reviews, um, and lectured uh, widely internationally. Um, of interest is uh, in 2019, uh, Dr. Bauer established a translational science research program to better define molecular landscape of pediatric thyroid cancer um, in order to enhance our understanding of this disease. And um, during the past year, um, the, he uh, launched the North American Child and Adolescent Thyroid Consortium to expand multicenter collaboration. He is currently the chair of the ATA Pediatric Thyroid Nodule and Thyroid Cancer Guidelines. Um, and so he is certainly uh, most qualified uh, to provide commentary on uh, the guidelines that have been introduced um, in the Netherlands and um, those that are published here in the US. So with that, I want to welcome our colleagues and Dr. Van Satent is going to um, start with a presentation here. Yeah, so good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. It's really an honor for us to be able to present our uh, Dutch national recommendations for the treatment of childhood differentiated thyroid cancer. So my name is Hanneke van Santen, and uh, next to me with a meter and a half is Dr. Levink, and we will give this presentation together. So we have no disclosures. Um, so first, let me start to talk to you about how the care is organized in Holland. So here you see a picture of our hospital. This is the Wilhelmina Children's Hospital, and you can see the flat meadows in Holland. And this green meadow just beside the Wilhelmina Ch Children's Hospital is here still empty. But in 2013, a new building was built, and this is the Princess Maxima Center for Pediatric Oncology. 
And in this center, all children with cancer in Holland are being seen, diagnosed and treated. And you can see this bridge between the two hospitals. So uh, all the consultations from the Wilhelmina Children's Hospital that are done in the Maxima from the pediatric endocrinology. Now, due to the centralization of care for children with cancer, we had a big discussion in Holland. Where should we treat children with thyroid cancer? Because is this a disease for the pediatric oncologist or is it a disease for the endocrinologist? And uh, me as a Dutch pediatric endocrinologist, I very much find this an endocrine disease, but this is, it's good to realize that this is very much different across Europe and perhaps also in the US. Whereas in Germany, the nuclear physician may be the main treating physician. In the UK, this may be the oncologist. And in Holland, this is the pediatric endocrinologist. When we think where thyroid cancer should be treated, uh, we should also discuss where should a child with a thyroid nodule be seen? Because of course, a thyroid nodule in a child may be indicative of thyroid cancer. Um, if we choose that this should be done in a thyroid expertise center where many adults are seen, it's very important to realize that children and adults uh, may be different. Um, so this uh, was a big discussion uh, for uh, more than a year. Um, and if we first look at the thyroid nodule, uh, of course, in childhood, palpable thyroid nodules are very rare. And uh, we've looked at all the studies that have been done and uh, the prevalence of thyroid nodules in ultrasound is about 0.2-5% of children. And only and in adolescents, of course, this increases to about 13%. And the ev evaluation of a thyroid nodule begins by determining its risk to be a cancer. And this risk in children is much higher than it is for adults. So the first thing you do when you see a child with a thyroid nodule is to, uh, to see, is it really a thyroid nodule? So many times, and you've probably all encountered this too, that a thyroid nodule is in fact not a thyroid nodule. It could be a thyroiditis or a thyroid cyst, or it may be a child with a goiter, or maybe the enlargement is a parathyroid gland. In very rare cases, it can even be a lymphoma. And of course, lymph adenopathy in children is very frequent and can also be related to a viral infection. So it's really important that an experienced pediatric thyroid radiologist does this first workup. Now, if we look at the incidence of differentiated thyroid cancer in Holland, so here you see a picture of our small country. So the incidence is about 0.4 to 1.5 per 100,000. And in Holland, we looked retrospectively and we found that in a period of 43 years, uh, there were 170 children diagnosed. So that's about eight to 10 per year. So that's a really small amount. And this again indicates that the care for these children should be centralized to gain some expertise. But then again, where should this be done? Should this be done in a thyroid team or in the pediatric oncology hospital? If we were to choose for a thyroid team where they treat many adult patients, this could be a good choice. This team should be very much aware that the guidelines for adults are not the same as for children. I don't have to tell you that because the Americans have already a very good uh, guideline for children with thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer. And we also, together with my German colleagues, uh, wrote a paper about the differences between children and adults. So just to summarize, so nodules in children are much less frequent than in adults. A thyroid nodule in a child has a much greater risk for malignancy and more often there's a genetic predisposition syndrome present or it's a secondary nodule such as after exposure to radiation. For thyroid cancer in children, there are more often lymph node and pulmonary metastasis and extrathyroidal extension. Children with uh, papillary thyroid cancer have an excellent uptake of radioiodine. And despite extensive disease, children usually have an excellent prognosis with uh, around a mortality of 2% versus 6 to 15% described in adult cohorts. In children, it's also important to realize that there can be a continued clinical response. So if you've treated a child with radioactive iodine, the terioglobulin, which can be used as a marker for thyroid cancer, can decline in the months and even in the year after uh, giving uh, radioiodine treatment. And also the late effects for radioactive iodine for a child may be different than for an adult. If you're 10 and you've had irradiation or you're 60 and you have irradiation, the late effects after 10 to 20 years, of course, may differ. 
So with all this in mind, we made a flow chart for the organization of care for diagnostics and treatment for the child presenting with a thyroid nodule in Holland. And we divided the levels of care into four different levels. So the first level is the general practitioner who sees the child with a lump in the neck and he or she may already order a neck ultrasound or directly refer to level two, which is the pediatrician. The pediatrician, of course, has more knowledge about children with lumps in the neck and he, he or she may do further examinations and then refer to the pediatric endocrinologist. At the academic hospital where the pediatric endocrinologists work, there it can be decided to make the thyroid ultrasound and when indicated do the fine needle aspiration cytology or biopsy. But if it's thyroid cancer, we feel that all children should only be treated in a level four hospital, which is a hospital with a thyroid expert team. Now, what is this? So we said to be a level four hospital, you have to have a multidisciplinary team with expert on the thyroid disease. And it should include pediatric endocrinologist, pediatric radiologist, nuclear physician, adult endocrinologist, endocrine surgeon with a minimum of 20 thyroid surgeries per year. Surgery should always be done by the endocrine surgeon in combination with the pediatric surgeon. And the team should also be a pediatric oncologist, pathologist, a clinical geneticist, and a pediatric uh, psycholog psychologist. Um, and for the Dutch, uh, these are the academic hospitals and everybody agreed on this. In this team, we have our weekly board meetings. Um, and since uh, a year and a half now, we have three monthly national meetings. These are virtual meetings in which we present all our new patients of the last three months to discuss these with each other and to make sure that we all have the same policy. So due to this discussion after the centralization of pediatric oncology care, we already were together with this group for more than a year and we decided that the most logical next step would be to make a Dutch recommendation for pediatric cancer thyroid cancer. And that's what we did. And we will present it to you today. And these are the people of the working group, which are very diverse, endocrinologists, oncologists, radiologists, nuclear medicine. Um, and we had two great coordinators who took care of everything. When we finished the Dutch recommendation, we decided we have to do more than this because Holland is very small and we need to harmonize our treatment with Europe. So with the European Thyroid Association, we formed a task force um, together with colleagues from Germany, the UK, Poland and Italy, uh, and even uh, Dr. Takano from Japan is uh, helping us, who has a lot of uh, knowledge about thyroid nodules, of course, after the Fukushima disaster. Um, and we hope to be able to present the European recommendation uh, in the fall at the next uh, European Thyroid Association meeting. So for now, I will give the floor to Chantal Levink. She's the coordinator of the Dutch recommendation and she will present it uh, to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, today I will present uh, the nas new national recommendations for treatment of pediatric uh, differentiated thyroid carcinoma in the Netherlands. And next to our paper, we also developed a dynamic uh, online flowchart, uh, which can be found on the website of OncoGuide and also using this QR code. Uh, we chose for this dynamic flowchart because we realized that some parts, for example, uh, genetic analysis, are rapidly changing fields. And with these flowcharts, we are able to update the recommendation based on the newest evidence. Um, I will start uh, with telling you how we developed these recommendations, and then I will take you through all recommendations using a recent a pediatric case out of our clinic. And first, a committee of experts uh, was asked to develop the Dutch recommendations and every expert represented his or her own uh, discipline in the committee. And three working groups were formed. First, the working group uh, diagnostics and follow-up. The second was the nuclear treatment and imaging working group. And the third was the surgery working group. Uh, we chose for a guideline adaptation process instead of producing a totally new guideline because several uh, pediatric guidelines already exist and this uh, was considered as the most efficient way. Uh, we identified all existing guidelines and review articles uh, by literature search and in total six uh, review articles were included. Um, 
The included articles were screened on quality uh, using the AGREE instrument, instrument. And as you can see in this table in the first column, uh, the ATA guideline is shown. And the ATA guideline uh, was reviewed as highest quality guideline. And therefore, we chose uh, this guideline as cornerstone to uh, develop the Dutch recommendations. Well, if all members agreed on the ATA recommendation, uh, no further research or discussion was necessary. But uh, if based on the current Dutch policy or on expert opinion uh, discussion points uh, were identified, well, research que questions were conducted and a literature search was uh, performed. Um, working group A looked at the risk factors influencing uh, disease scores uh, regarding follow-up and they also looked at the optimal uh, recovery time after surgery and for how long TSH suppression therapy should be given and uh, what the additional value is of ultrasound and other imaging modalities uh, during follow-up. Uh, working group B looked at the long-term effects of differentiated microcarcinoma in children, but also at the experiences in imaging uh, with 124 iodine and uh, FTDG PET in children, and what the administered dose uh, of radioactive iodine should be in children. And the last working group lo looked at how specific different suspicious ultrasound findings are for the presence of uh, metastasis to a lymph node, but also if we should have risk stratification with regards to initial surgical treatments. And they also looked at the differences in extension of disease between children and adults. Uh, based on the most recent evidence in combination with uh, expert opinion, our recommendations were uh, developed. And now I will guide you through all recommendations using a pediatric case. Uh, last year, we saw a girl of nine years old with no history of disease. And um, she was referred uh, to our clinic with a lump in her neck. She did not have any complaints. And with physical examination, a lump in her neck was felt. It was a fixed mass and uh, no other lymph, no lymph nodes were palpable. Um, the blood results uh, showed TSH and FT4 within the reference range. And then we perform, performed an ultrasound and on the ultrasound a solid mass was seen in the left uh, thyroid lobe and also a hypoechogenic halo was seen um, and the mass was as called taller than white. Uh, no calcifications or lymph adenopathy in the neck uh, were found. And if we classify these ultrasound findings uh, following the thyroid class classification, um, we found three uh, suspicious characteristics leading to an estimated risk of malignancy in children around uh, 70%. Next step was a fine needle uh, aspiration cytology and that was performed in this girl and we found a Bethesda 6 in this girl. So we had a high suspicion of uh, thyroid carcinoma in this girl. If the FNA had shown a Bethesda 5, uh, the working group advised us to perform molecular gene analysis of at least uh, BRAF gene uh, mutation for standard care um, and other gene mutations could also be analyzed as well uh, but we consider this as research since the presence of other gene mutations uh, do not have consequences for further management at the moment in the Netherlands but we realize that this is a rapid chasing field and uh, this should be of course uh, be evaluated in the future so the first step um, in case of a Bethesda 6 is to start with preoperative management comprising an ultrasound of the whole neck. And the working group also recommends to consider if additional, man additional imaging is uh, indicated. And the working group advisors 
uh, MRI in case of a large or fixed thyroid mass, in case of focal cord paralysis or uh, bulky lymph adenopathy or tumor invasion. The working group also advises to consider a low dose CT contrast without a CT thorax without contrast in case of substantial cervical lymph nodes disease to detect potential lung metastasis with the argument that the lung metastasis are found, um, the activity of radioactive iodine could be adjusted. Next, we advise a total thyroidectomy for all children with a Betesta 6 or a Betesta 5 with uh, be ref mutation and only for some selected patients for example patients uh, with microcarcinoma limited to, to the thyroid um, there could be an indication for lobectomy or hemithyroidectomy but we advise to always discuss this in a tumor board meeting uh, for patients with uh, betesta 5 but without a BRF mutation first a hemithyroidectomy is advised to confirm the diagnosis and in case of suspect lymph nodes in the neck uh, lymph nodes dissection is indicated and the location of the suspect uh, lymph nodes is of course important uh, central Neck dissection is indicated if preoperative lymph nodes are found on ultrasound or in case of perioperative visible extra capsular growth. And furthermore, the working group advises lateral lymph node dissection in all children with preoperative proven lymph node metastasis. But an exception of cytological confirmation can be made in case of pathological. Uh, lateral lymph nodes. In our case, a total thyroidectomy without lymph node dissection was performed and the pathology showed a papillary thyroid carcinoma with a maximum diameter of five centimeters, um, but the tumor was erratically removed um, and no lymph nodes were found. The next step is the additional treatment with radioactive iodine. Uh, the working group advises that all children uh, should receive additional iodine treatment to treat the uh, potential micrometastasis, but an exception could be made for children with micro uh, PTC. And these children should be discussed in a tumor board meeting. In our case, uh, the tumor was irrevocably removed and this was a pre-pubertal uh, girl, so uh, the working group advised 100 megabecquerel per kilo as the activity. Uh, for follow-up, uh, the working group advises risk stratification using the ATA uh, pediatric risk levels with three risk groups, uh, low risk, high risk, or low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk. And the first step is uh, TSH suppression therapy with uh, a TSH goal um, dependent on the risk level. Uh, furthermore, neck ultrasound in combination with a TG measurement has, uh, is proven to be a sensitive tool and therefore the working group recommends as well to uh, measure thyroglobulin as well to perform ultrasound during follow-up with the uh, interval depending on the risk level. Our case was stratified as low risk uh, and therefore the TSH goal was uh, 0.5 to 1 and um, after three months and after six months no TG was uh, measured or not detectable and on the ultrasound after six months, uh, no suspect characteristics were seen. Um, the working group uh, recommends to measure st stimulated TG after, six of, after 12 months, and the stimulated TG uh, can be done using withdrawal or uh, after recombinant TSH. However, data regarding the use of recombinant TSH in children are limited 
and it's not approved for children uh, by the medicine agency at the moment and therefore the working group uh, recommends uh, recombinant TSH only in selected patients. If TG is detectable, additional imaging using neck ultrasound is required and in patients previously treated with uh, radioactive iodine but without suspect findings on a neck ultrasound, the working group advises imaging using FTG PET CT or 123 iodine uh, wall body scan. Both imaging modalities have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and the, for example, the FTG PET is more sensitive and has a higher rate, but has a higher rate of uh, false positive findings in children, for example, due to uh, viral infections. Well, this was a short overview of uh, our recommendations. Many recommendations overlap with those of the ATA pediatric guideline. However, there are also some differences in recommendations, and I would like to point out these. First, uh, preoperative. In contrast to the ATA uh, recommendation, the working group does not uh, recommend a chest X-ray in children with substantial cervical lymph node disease because of lack of sensitivity of a chest X-ray in this setting. Uh, the working group also prefers a neck MRI in favor of a neck CT with contrast as preoperative imaging because of higher resolution and good soft, good soft tissue um, contrast on an MRI, especially in children uh, who have minimal fatty tissue in the neck. In contrast to the ATA recommendation, uh, the working group does not advise preoperative imaging with, uh, of using CT with contrast. Then refraining from cytological confirmation in lateral lymph nodes um, is possible in case of a uh, palpable pathological lymph node. And um, then the working group advises molecular gene analysis, at least of BREF gene mutation for standard care in case of Bethesda 6, uh, 5. Um, and other gene mutations could be analyzed as well, and we do this as research, but we consider this still as research. Um, and of course, we realize this is rapidly changing, so uh, this should be evaluated. Then operatively, most important difference is that the working group does not advise a prophylactic central neck dissection because all children will be treated with additional iodine therapy to treat the potential micrometastasis. So the working group discussed a lot about this and weighted the disadvantages of more extended surgery with the disadvantages of late effects of iodine treatment and the working group came to this uh, recommendation. Then postoperatively, uh, the working group does not advise restaging with 122 or 124 iodine uh, wall body scan because all children will receive additional iodine treatment and a post ablation scan will be made used as uh, restaging. In these recommendations, um, the activity of iodine treatment is based on expert opinion due to a lack evidence. And then uh, during follow-up, uh, the working group does not advise to perform a 123 uh, wall body scan uh, be because um, the working group thinks that uh, neck ultrasound in combination with TG is a very sensitive tool and other uh, imaging modalities should only be used uh, on indication. So these were the most, uh, the biggest uh, differences. And in conclusion, uh, treatment of pediatric DTC is challenging and the optimal treatment approach cannot be fit in a one size uh, fits all model. And it requires a multidisciplinary approach in thyroid cancer expertise uh, centers. 
and we aim to develop less aggressive treatment uh, recommendations um, and thereby minimizing the long-term uh, adverse consequences. And in the future, we are hopefully able to predict which patients are at risk and which need more aggressive treatment and which are not, uh, for example, by genetic profiling. And at last, uh, with the relatively low numbers of patients in the Netherlands, we definitely have to cross borders and uh, to collaborate to uh, treat the children in the most optimal way. I would like to thank all the uh, all our colleagues who have worked on these recommendations and we also would like to thank you uh, once again for uh, the invitation. Okay. Um so I have the next portion and then hopefully we have, um, well, not hopefully, we will have some time um, to have some questions. So please hold your questions and hopefully we can go over them uh, at the end. Uh, those are my disclosures. And then first I'd just like to start by saying thank you to thank again for this opportunity. We always are very appreciative uh, when we have an ability to go over pediatric thyroid disease. Um, to have an audience to present our ideas and to actually hear back from the audience. So we hope to answer your questions during this, you know, this time frame, but please feel free to contact us and to um, help advance uh, this field because we really do need to build uh, communities across borders as uh, was just concluded at the end of this really lovely presentation. I also want to say congratulations to Hanukkah and, and the whole guideline committee. Um, if, if People have not been on guideline committees. They're really very um, difficult to get a consensus, especially uh, when there's very little data as far as prospective data. So the nice thing I think in pediatrics and pediatric thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer is the outcomes are quite good. And so the guidelines are guidelines. Uh, there are no laws about this. Um, and I think it's each of our attempts, each of our group's attempts to try to uh, establish um, paradigms that help decrease complications. And several years ago, the, the Netherlands uh, published the complication rate within their, their country. And I think from that, um, they then decided to energize and to mobilize and to organize to, to put a, together a guideline. So I just want to congratulate them and, and hopefully we can all work together, um, not just within the European community, but across the ocean, not just across borders within Europe. So our guidelines were published in 2015 uh, after many years of trying to work on them. And now, uh, as was mentioned, we're working on the second version of these. Why we developed the guidelines? Um, because we all were aware in pediatrics of differences compared to adults. There was a higher risk for a malignancy in a nodule if it presented in a pediatric patient, a higher likelihood that if it was papillary thyroid cancer, there was spread to lymph nodes uh, within the region of the neck, most commonly the, the, the central neck level six but also the lateral neck, uh, and then an increased risk of distant metastasis for patients with lateral neck metastasis. And then an increased risk of um, recurrence. The data, again, not uh, robust, but there's at least two studies, one from the UK, and then the graph to the right is from the Mayo Clinic, uh, showing up to nearly a 30% recurrence over a child's lifetime after being treated uh, within the pediatric timeframe. So because of those things, um, prior to the guidelines, there was a general approach that you know, the word aggressive is sometimes hard to, to define, but it was kind of standard and at least um, followed this type of paradigm that every patient with uh, a nodule, many of them didn't even have an FNA prior to surgery. Uh, if it was a malignant FNA, if they had one or if it looked concerning an ultrasound, they would have a total thyroidectomy. If it was thyroid cancer, they would all receive radioactive iodine, either ablation for a remnant disease, uh, for a thyroid remnant or uh, therapy if there is evidence of persistent um, metastatic disease. And then if there's persistent disease, there'd be more surgery, more radioactive iodine. Uh, and that was repeated uh, until we achieved a, a non, an undetectable uh, TG. During my fellowship, um, we would start to wonder about if we had reached a maximum dose of radioactive iodine when, when we got to 1,000 millicuries, cumulative dose. And I think those times have thankfully changed. Um, now we think about every dose and what the benefit, potential benefit of each dose is. Because that was, but because all these things were kind of in the setting of what is quite fortunate 
for us in pediatrics is a very low disease specific mortality and more than 98% of our patients survive. So because of that, we started looking at, well, you know, if patients are surviving, what's the morbidity of the disease? And we realized that there was surgical morbidity. The younger the patient, the higher the risks. Um, and the two greatest risks, as everyone knows, is recurrent laryngeal nerve damage and permanent hypoparathyroidism. So those are the two goals for decreasing surgical risk. But there's also risk to radioactive iodine. Radioactive iodine, as all of us are aware, is highly effective targeted therapy with very low risks. Um, but there are risks either early, intermediate, and then all of us are concerned, of course, of long-term risks, either from you know, pulmonary fibrosis, from repeated high delivered activities over short periods of time, and then the, the concern for um, radioactive iodine-induced second malignancies, and even, even some concern for gonadal toxicity, which the Dutch guidelines talk about, as, actually, as far as sperm banking in males undergoing uh, radioactive iodine treatment for, for thyroid cancer. In the setting of radioactive iodine, the issue was, while the risks were low, the benefit as far as disease-specific survival was not very impressive. So if you look at the two timeframes at the bottom of this um, uh, slide, 1973 to 1981, and then compared to the 2000s, compared to the top who was actually receiving radioactive iodine, there was really no impact on disease-specific survival. So if the risks are low, but the benefit is also low, it still begged the question, do all patients benefit? And that was kind of our focus for the 2015 guidelines. I think of any country, any, any group uh, that's trying to develop guidelines within pediatric thyroid nodule and thyroid cancer treatment, evaluation treatment, all of us are trying to achieve the same things. We want to reduce complications, surgical and medical. We want to maintain disease, uh, low disease-specific mortality. We want to achieve remission, and we want to avoid recurrence. So I think that the intent for all of us is quite focused on our patients. Um, and I think, as I said, there's different ways of approaching this. So since 2015, there's been a number of other guidelines. Uh, the Polish uh, community pu published guidelines in 2016. There was a summary of how patients are being treated within the European community in 2018. And then um, the guidelines, which we just heard um, a really nice presentation on um, that have come out of the Netherlands. So if we think about how do we think, how, you know, how should we use the resources we have, we have to put this within the context. So thyroid nodules within pediatrics are all, you know, the risks for developing them, I think, are, of course, the same irrespective of, um, of center of country, uh, with the exception of um, iodine sufficiency and um, status and iodine status. So there are some differences for that. And I think there's also some differences for brighter mental exposures. Um, and it'd be interesting to see why, you know, the Netherlands is obviously a much smaller population than the U.S., um, but I think their exposure, environmental exposures may also be quite different. And so maybe their somatic mutation um, incidence uh, is also different. So we have to think about some, not just the incidence, but what's the difference in the country and the environment um, what's the difference for access to health care? Uh, it's certainly different for, for countries that have socialized health care compared to private insurance, and we certainly have our challenges uh, within the United States. So those are the contexts that we have to work in, and then we have to put that into the context of what's the incidence, and then how do we decide on stratifying surgery, stratifying medical care? Do we have a standard approach because it's a low incidence, or do we try to individualize therapy because it's a higher incidence and we have higher resources? So in the United States, you know, within the last couple decades, the incidence has increased, and it's mostly in the adolescents, mostly in adolescent girls. And within that population, it's about 25 per million, which is somewhere between non-Hodgkin's and Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's compared to the Dutch, as you already heard, which is a very low incidence uh, of disease. So um, there's, there's clearly differences. And based on that, there's going to be different investment as far as resources and different um, concerns as far as complications of therapy if there's a lower volume of, of patients going through our um, healthcare system. At CHOP, which is a little bit of an outlier, I think we're quite busy at CHOP. Uh, we see about almost 30 new thyroid cancer patients a year that undergo primary surgery at our hospital, and at least another 15 that get that we're seeing for a second eval or post-surgery and pre-radioactive iodine or tumor predisposition syndromes. So we have uh, quite a high volume uh, within CHOP. And again, things that we decide to do at CHOP obviously have to be put in the context of how what the incidence is at another center in another country. Um, so these are all things that we're well aware of when we try to develop guidelines. So the ATA guidelines, we tried to 
to try to improve care um, by suggesting that all patients need FNA prior to surgery. We provided the option to follow benign cytology. We did suggest that papillary thyroid cancer, we didn't talk about variants, but all patients should undergo total thyroidectomy. And we recommended high consideration for prophylactic central neck dissection, not to decrease mortality, which is not a metric that's useful in pediatrics, but in an effort to define metastatic behavior so we could stratify medical therapy, radioactive iodine therapy in particular. For minimally invasive follicular thyroid cancer, which follicular thyroid cancer is uncommon in pediatrics, but thankfully most of it is minimally invasive, not widely invasive, uh, we did recommend in those guidelines that lobectomy could be considered. Radioactive iodine, as you heard, we stratified, and again, as I already went over, the question was, not is it does it work? Of course, it works quite nicely. It's very targeted, um, but do all patients benefit from it? So this is kind of the summary of where we ended up when we published the 2015 guidelines: total thyroidectomy, prophylactic neck section, stratification of radioactive iodine. But in the adult world, there's still uh, you know greater information that's available, and we're trying to figure out how can we use that information within pediatrics. What's safe? What's effective? what's appropriate, um, and all those things need to be put within the context of a child that has a greater life, greater number of years ahead of them after we evaluate and treat them. So the stratification of surgery, not just stratification of medical therapy, and then using oncogene profile, specialized imaging, non-surgical techniques to uh, ablate benign nodules and to ablate <clears throat> persistent cervical neck disease that may be less than a centimeter and only one or two lymph nodes. And then of course, incorporation of systemic therapy um, for patients that are that have either radioactive iodine refractory disease uh, or um, they absorb radioactive iodine but still have progressive disease. So we already went over the, the differences, which I won't go over again, but one of the lovely things I think that the Netherlands have um, done is create this web-based dynamic ability to update their guidelines. I think that's really a paradigm that all of us should be tackling because trying to do guideline updates every three to five years is really difficult. And the ATA is actually considering ways of doing this as well so that we can decide if there's something that is highly, um, has high quality that we don't wait years to incorporate that, those changes into our guidelines. So briefly, just to go over some of the controversies and the contrast, I think that between what we hope to do in the version two, and I'm on the committee, but this is my opinion, we don't have consensus. So please, um, this is my opinion, not, not, not anything that's for sure in the guidelines yet. But how do we incorporate molecular testing, um, you know, it, following patients with indeterminate cytology? I think the Dutch are, are correct, and I think even uh, Ari Wassner's group out of Boston has already suggested this. So for category three, follicular lesion of undetermined significance, there are patients that can be followed that do not need resection. Do all patients need uh, thyroidectomy if they have papillary thyroid cancer, or could lobectomy be brought into it? Do all patients need prophylactic central neck dissection, or are there avenues to help select which patients benefit and don't benefit. Radioactive iodine, uh, I think we would continue, um, but the question of course is frequency, and then there are many other things like how do we incorporate oncogene driver alterations, not just for diagnostics, um, but for therapy, uh, for stratification of therapy and systemic therapy. So very briefly, um, indeterminates, these are the potential uh, surgical histology when we have a nodule with indeterminate cytopathology. Up to 2015, lobectomy was the approach, and then based on the surgical path, we would decide if we would follow or go back for a completion. The molecular testing that's available is listed here. This is now uh, across both pediatrics and adults, um, but within adult, within pediatrics, really the oncogene testing, not the, not the microRNA and not the gene expression or sequencing classifiers, are the only ones that are validated. I just saw a patient yesterday that had an Affirma test and was a 16-year-old. Um, that is not validated in pediatrics. So the, the oncogene testing for that um, panel is excellent. It's just as good as anyone else, but the sequencing classifier is it's unknown how to interpret that within pediatrics. Our guidelines, we didn't have sufficient evidence, so we said we can't routinely measure it. But since that time, there's been an increasing number of publications on uh, the oncogenic, somatic, oncogenic driver uh, landscape within pediatrics. And it's different than adults. BRAF uh, is around 30%, but fusions are quite, are, are more common. And then RAS and RAS-like mutations, including DICER-1P10 uh, and RAS are less common in pediatrics. 
The, so the use of these for diagnostic uh, um, utility, I think there is data to support this, not just BRAF. And if you use BRAF, I think it's you know it's 100% specific for PTC if you find a mutation, but often the ultrasound will confirm or suggest that a BRAF mutation is there. So it's typically found in lesions that have a high uh, TIRAD score, whatever system you're using for preoperative evaluation of a nodule. And it's a rule in test. So if you have it, there's a high likelihood of either a neoplasm at, at least, if not an invasive uh, um, um, cancer. So it's a very good U rule and test and the states the challenge is getting insurance to pay for it. But as far as what other, how, you know, what other controversies exist, well, let's just start with surgery. So these are the guidelines that have recommended total thyroidectomy for, for papillary thyroid cancer, really based on data that said, if you don't do this, you increase the risk of persistent or recurrent disease. Uh, and our guidelines are included in that list of four that you can see there. Since that time, there's been certainly adult data showing that um, encapsulated follicular variant of pathway thyroid cancer can be, you can achieve surgical remission with lobectomy. And at least two studies, the first out of um, Jonathan Wasserman's group in, in Toronto, and then we had a follow-on study. Um, there are patients with follicular variant PTC where lobectomy uh, can can be used to achieve surgical remission. And you can see some of the um, data, some of the post-surgical and pre-surgical data that would help select which patients um, where lobectomy could be considered. Um, as far, so that would add to the potential for not just minimally invasive FTC, but maybe some patients, a subgroup of patients with encapsulated follicular variant. What about classic PTC? Well, the concern, of course, is that there's bilateral disease. Um, we've always kind of quoted 20 to 30 percent. We recently looked and published uh, what it was in our population. It was actually about 38 percent of patients with bilateral disease, uh, and about a quarter of them we couldn't identify in preoperative ultrasound. So, for patients that had preoperative markers such as multifocal disease, tumors greater than two centimeters, abnormal lymph nodes, uh, clearly a total thyroidectomy would be indicated. If you did a lobectomy for, as as we as was already presented, for a patient with a micro uh, papillothyroid microcarcinoma, a T1A tumor, um, but it showed extrathyroidal extension, whether it was micro or not, because uh, we published on that, um, there was evidence of lymphatic invasion or central neck disease, uh, then a completion would be indicated. If there wasn't, they could potentially be followed uh, with lobectomy alone. We're further looking into our, our T1 data now. And then interestingly, just this year, Sujina et al. from, from Japan published uh, on 153 pediatric patients where lobectomy was completed in 76%, and they perform ipsilateral central neck dissection for all patients over the last 10, uh, 20 years. And what they found was a relatively high recurrence. I'm not sure any of us would be completely happy with that. Um, but if you look at the, the subgroup that they defined as low risk, which you can see at the bottom of the slide, there was less than a 7% risk of recurrent disease. So again, suggesting that maybe some patients with papillothyroid microcarcinoma um, could be uh, treated with lobectomy with, of course, with surveillance after that. So I'm not sure where we fall yet for classic PTC, but I think there is some interest in trying to figure out if lobectomy is adequate and there are some data to suggest uh, it may be possible, but of course we need more information. The central neck dissection, as I mentioned, uh, we use that information to stratify medical therapy in our guidelines. We were not very uh, good at defining how many lymph nodes define low risk uh, disease, but since that time, a paper from South Korea helped us. Um, so if a prophylactic, ipsilateral prophylactic neck dissection is completed and there's less than or equal to five lymph nodes, uh, that patient could still be followed without radioactive iodine. So those are things that we're looking at in our second version of the guidelines. As far as the risk, a surgical risk of prophylactic central neck, there's um, two good studies by high volume groups. The first out of Germany, which is a highly respected surgical group, uh, looking at 230 patients. And you can see at the bottom, a relatively high incidence of permanent hypoparathyroidism, even with high volume, excellent uh, uh, surgeons. In our experience at our hospital, the, the risk is quite low. We've had two surgeons now over 700 surgeries and the risk of permanent hypopara and recurrent laryngeal nerve damage is less than 1%. So again, you have to kind of know your practice and know your surgeons to, to know how to incorporate some of these recommendations and guidelines. Last, as was mentioned, um, oncogenic driver and how can we use this beyond diagnostics? So 
Fusions are clearly associated um, with more invasive um, disease in pediatrics, whether they're RET fusions, NTRAP fusions, ALP fusions, BRAP fusions, which are the least common of that list. Um, they are associated and appear to be associated with a higher risk of lymph node disease and even pulmonary disease. And this is a, high, a focus of our group uh, at CHOP and the focus of um, several other groups as well. Within this cohort of patients, if you look at non-invasive differentiated thyroid cancer, these are mutations that are most commonly associated with non-invasive uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, RAS, dicer one P10, PAX8, PPAR gamma fusions, and the BRAF 601E. In adults, just as one example, if a patient has an ultrasound that shows a low-risk lesion, they're RAS positive. If you compare that to an adult patient with a BRAF mutation, you can see the risk for extra thyroid extension, lymphovascular invasion, lymph node mets, distant mets is quite low in patients with RAS. Of course, RAS covers the entire spectrum from benign to highly invasive dedifferentiated disease, but within patients that on preoperative evaluation have non-invasive disease, um, the presence of it is consistent with the lower risk for lymph node mets and could be used to decide if a prophylactic central neck dissection would be beneficial. Within our invasive cohort, um, these are the mutations, as I already mentioned, that are the most common. The, the image that you see on the slide is diffuse sclerosis invariant and just showing the left lobe with a lateral neck lymph node metastasis. So I think there is now data to suggest, and I've published on this, that potentially, and we need to do this prospectively, we could use oncogenic data to even decide on um, surgical stratification. So whether a, a completion or a total would be indicated and potentially whether prophylactic central neck would be indicated or not indicated. Um, so I think this is an area that deserves our attention and deserves prospective studies. And of course, um, the knowledge of some of these mutations is highly um, useful, uh, has high utility uh, for patients that have refractory progressive disease. Uh, and that's just a paper we published this year discussing that. So I'm gonna end is just say, we are making headway. Um, we're moving forward, I think, in pediatric thyroid cancer. There's different groups doing different things, but all of us are trying to do the same and that's improve our ability to take care of our patients. And so we need to decide how we incorporate this information into our second version, which we're working on. Um, the Dutch have decided within their group um, how they are gonna incorporate this information. And that's, you know, as I said, everyone has to decide. And, and I think the intent for all of us is the same. So we've built a consortium in, in the States. Um, we now have five executive members. We're adding 20 more, hopefully in the next year. Um, and we hope to, to expand not just the community within within the United States, but hopefully globally as well. And with that, I'll end um, and leave 10 minutes for questions. That's awesome. Uh, thank you um, for your presentations, um, Hanukkah and Chantal, and thank you so much, Andy, for your uh, really wonderful discussion here. Um, I'd like to start off with a, um, just to get a better sense on the idea of centralizing pediatric thyroid care um, in the Netherlands. Um, what is this, how does this actually work? Um, how, how far do, um, in the worst case scenario, do uh, children and families have to travel? And how does this, um, is this well accepted by community physicians to hand over the care um, of these patients to a centralized um, uh, cancer center. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, good. Uh, well, thank you for your question. Um, it's a good question and it's quite a debate and sometimes also a struggle because if you decide that, that children should be centralized, this means that some physicians and hospitals taking care of those kids for years now will have to say, I have to stop doing this care and refer. So that has been a big discussion and not always a nice discussion. But I think if I look now and compare it to about five years ago, we do see centralization going further and further, and not just for thyroid cancer, but for many childhood diseases. Um, and if I look at the numbers, we see more and more referrals coming also to Utrecht, but also to Amsterdam and, the, and also to Groningen where uh, Terra Lynx is working. So there are, I think, three centers in the world or in the world, sorry, in Holland, uh, uh, doing the most children now, but it's not yet centralized into one center. This is politically uh, too difficult still. 
and is it well ac accepted by families um, to uh, to bring their children to a, lo a central location and the inconvenience associated with that? Yes, that's that's no problem. It's, uh, in fact, it's what parents want. Um, so some referrals I have gotten not because the physician refers, but because the parents have Googled and they've they found our center and they want to be referred. So parent and you know Holland is very small, so it's just a maximum drive of about an hour and a half, perhaps two, and then you're here. So it's so small. So so parents want centralization of care very much. Yeah. Great. Can you talk a little bit? Um, one of the major um, initiatives in the adult world is uh, to um, look at response to therapy and to modify follow-up as well as TSH suppression goals in um, based on uh, parameters both biochemical as well as radiographic. Can you speak to that um, in the uh, pediatric population and tied into that, can you talk a little bit about what the long-term impact is of TSH suppression on the developing child? Yes, very good question. So um, we just had a PhD student uh, in Groningen who looked at the late effects of uh, treatment for childhood thyroid cancer. And she also aimed to look at the effect of TSH suppression on the heart. And she did find more diastolic dysfunction in uh, long-term survivors of childhood thyroid cancer. Uh, but we couldn't really find a relationship to the level of TSH. Uh, but this is also because that was, I think, retrospective, and it's very hard to find the association. So I think this is also something we have to study more prospectively. Um, we do, uh, in our new recommendation, we did state that dependent on the risk uh, classification, you could choose not to suppress your TSH too low. So we have this low risk, intermediate risk, high risk category. And the high risk you really should suppress, but if you are a year uh, in follow-up and your TG is not detectable, you can increase or let your TGs come up a little bit. You don't have to suppress it for life. Um, so we're trying also in this, and I think also in agreement with Dr. Bauer's speech, um, we also see and feel that mortality is so low, uh, the later the long-term survivors um, uh, have uh, have the, the most complications of their late effects. So our aim should be to keep mortality low, but to minimize morbidity, which is, of course, the effects of TSH suppression, radioiodine, and surgery. So also with the TSH suppression, I think we could suppress a little bit less, uh, aiming to decrease the late effects. And, 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 go ahead, Andy. It is quick, Bob. I agree with everything Hanukkah said. And we my colleague Goli Mustafi Moab um, has just completed data collection on about 120 patients, kind of at at, a, at initiation and one year later, using quantitative CT and, and um, bone mineral density to look at bone acquisition during um, TSH suppression, because that's another concern of ours in pediatrics. So hopefully that data um, will have ready in the next year or so. Great. Um yeah, can I just, if I can just clarify one particular point in your presentation, Chantal, um, at, is it correct that uh, you will recommend to, or surgeons will proceed with a lateral neck dissection based on radiographic findings or ultrasound findings alone without confirmation from a biopsy? Well, um, well we prefer to do a biopsy, but if it's really, uh, Visible that, that that there is a metastasis lateral, um, then you you could uh, refrain from a biopsy. Only an option to refrain from, but in most cases we uh, recommend to do uh, uh, FNA. Yeah, okay. Pre yeah. Free. yeah. Right. Okay. Terrific. Um, and then just in the remaining moments here, um, if you could just talk a little bit about. Uh, how you transition your children to adulthood um, in terms of the handoff and uh, to adult um, endocrinologists and and or surgeons, or do you continue to follow them? Uh, what is your policy in the Netherlands and how seamlessly does that actually take place? 
Yes, yeah, so we transfer them when they're around 18 years of age um, and we transfer the, them to the adult endocrinologist with expertise in thyroid cancer. So, um, and uh, then we try to look at the home situation of the patient and we don't feel this should be centralized in Utrecht. So um, when a patient lives in the northern part of the Netherlands, we, we transfer to them to the academic hospital with a, an adult thyroid expertise team. Um, and uh, most of the time this is a so -called warm condition. Uh, so when it's in Utrecht, I see the patient together with the adult endocrinologist at the, in the same session. And from that moment on, the adult endocrinologist is the main physician. Great. Um, and uh, one last question, and that is uh, just the long-term impact on the developing child of permanent hypoparathyroidism. Is that a, um, is, does that have developmental implications uh, based on your experience? Um, if you could just comment on that in the remaining moment here. Um, I think my short answer is no. I don't think it has mental uh, long-term effects, but it is a very nasty complication having to take your calcium and your active vitamin D two or sometimes three times a day, especially in puberty when patients tend to forget their medication. They can have uh, very unpleasant muscle cramps and, and, and uh, tingling sensations. So it is something we really have to pay attention to. And I think it's one of the most nasty complications that you don't want to have in this treatment. Great. Um, the, the question I, I think you had asked about, uh, you interpreted that as being mental. Um, it was more, it was re, uh, develop, developmental, um, whether you see any uh, problems with the developing child who has uh, permanent hypoparathyroidism. Um, no, I don't really. You mean due to the very low calcium levels? Uh, uh, yes. Post yeah. No, I don't. I think we prevent them from the calcium levels to be very low. We have a very strict period and post-operative um, monitoring, so we prevent the calciums from dropping too low. Um, so no, I don't really uh, encounter developmental problems due to this. Great. Thank you all very much. Um, I want to especially thank our presenters today for joining us. Thank everybody. Um, wish everyone uh, a happy and a healthy new year, and I can't wait to uh, have uh, find the time when we don't have to encourage people uh, to stay safe here. Uh, unfortunately, we're not there yet. Um, so everyone, thank you, and look forward to having you join us again next week. Thank you, everyone. All the best, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.